Well, we are in this series titled, In the Ring, Fighting for What Matters Most. My name is Chris, and uh, this thought that's just going to tie this entire uh, series together is, well, there's these two truths that are really like, well, they're each side of a coin. One side is finding someone will track someone who is finding. It's just, it's just true. If you're trying to find the right one, if you're trying to find the right one to date, if you're trying to find the right friend, you're just out looking, I'm just going to say, finding someone, you, you will always just find someone who's also trying to find. And here's the issue with finding, and we just, we all get this. The finding always leads to finding out what's not right with the other person. Isn't it true? Husbands, wives, isn't it true? One moment you're in love, and all of a sudden you just discover Everything that's wrong with him, everything that's wrong with her, right? You find the right best friend, right? And all of a sudden you discover. And that's, that's the issue with finding. Finding always leads to, well, the list of things that's wrong with the other person. And that's why the flip side of this, this thought, the flip side of this coin, is what this series is really about. It's all about becoming. Because when we start looking, or when we stop looking for right, the right person, right, dating the right person, marriage the right person, and trying to find the perfect person, when we realize that finding always leads to find out what's wrong with someone, we start focusing on becoming. Because becoming, right, becoming will attract someone, other people that are focused on becoming. And when you start focused on who you need to become, what you need to look at when you start staring yourself in the mirror going, hey, there's areas within me that are broken. There's areas within me that are fractured. There's areas in me that there's a void within me. I need to focus on who God has designed me to be, who God has destined me to be. When I start staring at myself, right, becoming leads to being the right person, the best version of you. The perfect person? No. A person that will never have any issues? No. But again, becoming goes, you know what, I... I need to be the perfect version of me that I possibly can be. And so this whole series is all about what we need to do specifically to become who God has designed us to become. But yet there's something within us that still wants to find the right person, isn't there? And so you have to just ask yourself, well, what is it within us that even though we know it's all about, I can't fix anyone, I got to focus on me, but what is it about us that wants to default to finding or being found? Well, I think there's two reasons why, and these aren't going to be earth shattering. One is relationships are difficult, aren't they? Just they are. And we are in a constant pursuit. Again, you could be married and you're trying to be in a constant pursuit. And that's why you keep trying to fix your spouse in your hopes that they can be the right person for you. And if they're not, then you start looking elsewhere. Or if you're dating, you're still trying to find the perfect person, right? Relationships, we just get relationships are difficult. And becoming is difficult. Why? Well, we'd rather point out everyone else's faults, right, <laughs> than look at our own. We'd rather highlight other people's faults, but not, listen, becoming is difficult. There's a question I want to ask all of you, and uh, I know your answer. How do you like that? I'm going to ask a question that I just know. I know all your, your, your answer. Your, I know your answer will be no. Um, and, and, and yes, um, you might think I'm this intelligent. Um, I'm not. But you might think this because I already know your answer. And you're going to be in awe in a moment as I ask this question. And you are going to say no to this question. The question is this. Have you ever had a, re, uh, have you ever had a frictionless relationship? And you would say no. no. Right? Like No. If you're married, you're like, no. If you're married a second time, no, right? Married a fourth, no. Dating, no. If you have kids, no matter the age, no. 
If you've had a boss, no. If you've had employees, no. If you've been to a family reunion, no. Right? Like all of us, right? You know, like friction and relationships, they just go together. We all get that. So, so this, this question has to lead to, to another question. This has a more complicated answer to it. But before we get to that question, there's a little run-up to this question. So what we know about friction in all relationships, you know, whether it's an employee work relationship or marriage or something in between, what we know about all relationships have friction. And friction leads to fighting. So when you fight, now some of you, right now are bristling with the term fight because you went to some marriage conference, you went to some counselor and like relationships, you shouldn't fight, it's not healthy. So let me help some of you. Some of you love these three words, you're like, yeah. Some of you are like, oh, we, you shouldn't fight, Chris. So let me help you with this. Are you ready? I'm here to help you, okay? So let's rephrase when you fight. Uh, when you discuss with passion, does that make you feel better? Some of you are like, yeah, that does. Or uh, when you engage in robust dialogue, does that help some of you? This is my favorite one. Uh, when you leverage voice inflection to clearly articulate your point. <laughs> my wife and I have had that uh, argument before. Um, as one of us are passionately saying something, the other person will say at the most inopportune time, stop screaming at me, right? The other person, it's usually me, I'm like, no, I'm just passionate, right? And I was like, oh, we're screaming. So, However you want to phrase the three words when you fight, you can, you can apply any of these phrases to when you fight. When you f fight, here's the question. What is your fight goal? Some of you have never even thought about this question. W what is your fight goal? You have one. The question is, what is it? I think there's four fight goals in all fights. I'm going to be very transparent with the first one. This is my fight goal. And, and please know, and this is an important thing for me to preface, preference. I'm not bragging about it. I'm not like saying, ha, look at me, this is my... No, 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 I, I'm, just, I'm just being very transparent. This is my fight goal. Some of you, this will be your fight goal. My fight goal, whenever I fight with my wife or whenever I use voice inflection to, to articulate a point, you know what my fight goal is? To win. It just really is. Some of you are laughing because that's yours or that's your spouse. Some of you have an elbow ready because you're about ready just to jab the person next to you, right? You're like, yeah, right? I'm just telling you, right? A fight starts, and here's the thing, here's the thing, and I'm sure not, we're not the only marriage couple that deal with this. Like, all of a sudden, you get into a fight, and moments in or minutes in or hours into the fight, you, you don't remember what started the fight, but now you're in the fight, and you're going, and I'm just telling you, at some point, my entire goal is to win. And my wife will say, you could ask her, my wife will say, I don't fight fair, and I don't fight fair. I don't. For every strength, and all of you have those, Guess what is at the other side of the coin? A weakness, right? Let's just own that. You, you all have amazing strengths. There's, there's a dark side to your strength. One of my strengths, one, one, one of my strengths is uh, I'm very gifted in communication. I can leverage words to inspire, to encourage, to motivate, to connect. There's a back end, a dark side of that. Which is, in a fight, in a robust dialogue, I can twist my wife's words like this. I can flip her words upside down. I can get her talking in circles. I can take one thing she says and use it against her. I can position words in the most articulate way possible. And when I start doing that, it's to win. And I'm good at it. Is that your fight goal, to win? For some of you, your fight goal is to concede. Now, that might feel like better, you're like if you're thinking to yourself, okay, out of this list that Chris is going to give me, which one's the right one? None of them are, right, by the way, none of them. And here's the thing about conceding. Some of you are conceders, right? Like, you'll engage in the fight, you'll hit heads, you'll prove your point, and then at some point, you just concede inside. 
and you know the entire time because your spouse, the person you're dating, that other relationship, you know on the, on the outside their goal is to win. So you concede and you the entire time, you're smiling on the inside going, yeah, they, th- they think they've won. They haven't. Because you're just going to wait. You're going to wait. You're going to wait. And you're going to come back at them a different way. Right? You're conceding. <laughs> but that's your goal. Some of you, you avoid. You avoid. You just avoid. You're raising a family where you just shoved everything underneath the bed, right? You were raising a family where you never, you never uh, got out your thoughts. You were raising a family, and so you brought that into your marriage. You brought that into your dating relationship. You just brought that in, and, and you think, you know, you wear that as a badge of honor. Yeah, I just don't engage in fighting, but in all reality, you're just stuffing everything. At some point, it's going to come out in some way, and your goal is just to avoid everything, and how is that helping your marriage, your relationships thrive? It's not. And for some of you, you just leave. Friction happens and you leave. Friction happens within your marriage, you leave. Friction happens within a close friendship, you leave. Any friction that happens, that rises up, you just leave. And what's dangerous is winning, conceding, and avoiding can all lead to leaving as well. They all can. You see, there's a reason we tag this series in the ring with this line, fighting for what matters most. Because God's designed us for a relationship. And we should fight for our relationships. But here's what we know about friction that leads to fighting. What's revealed on the outside you know, in that moment, that's why I said, what is your fight goal? You have a fight goal. What is revealed on the outside is tethered to something on the inside. The question is, what is it tethered to? What is it tethered to? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Now, last week I gave a warning. Uh, the warning was focused on all you ladies. I, there was this insight that I was going to share with everyone, and I wanted to make sure, especially all you ladies, that you'd give me a few moments to explain this amazing insight, because on the surface it could create some friction, but it's actually such an, uh, such an empowering, empowering statement. So I gave this warning. I said, hey, don't, don't, don't leave. Don't log off from online. Don't, don't you know, hit pause on the video. Like, 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 give me a few moments. Give me a few moments, because it's really an empowering thought. Well, this is another warning. It's a different type of warning, but it's another warning. And here's the, here's the warning. What we're going to look at today is not like the three steps that you need to take to avoid friction in your relationships, the three steps you need to do to have healthy fighting goals in your relationship. It's not like the three-step type of message at all. It's going to come at it in a whole different direction, but I think it can transform all your, your relationships, your marriage, dating relationships, family relationships, parenting relationships, all relationships. Now, for some of you um, who aren't sure about God, I just want you I just want to say this. If you're not sure about God and the existence of God and who God is and all this, and you're just trying to make your way on the spiritual journey, I just want to encourage you, just try it. What we're going to look at, just try it. What I'm going to share with you, just try it. It can't, it can't hurt you. Just try it. Just try it. Because just maybe, just maybe, it's going to help you take another step in your relationship of discovering who God is. For some of you, uh, what I'm going to share with you today is going to feel like church speak and it's just going to be like ethereal, and you're going to be like, yeah, Chris, here you go. This is this church speak stuff, and this isn't practical. It's not going to help me in my relationship. I would just say, try it. It can't hurt the friction in your relationship. Now, just try it. For some of you, your marriage is crumbling, and it's, it's, it's all but over. I, I just say, try it. Try it. Try it. Some of you are still trying to decide if you want to find or become, and I would say, try it. Try it. This first insight is from a guy named Peter. Peter was part of uh, Jesus' leadership core. He was part of the 12 disciples. And what I love about Peter's story is this. Peter was kind of one, one foot in, one foot out with Jesus through the first kind of three years that Peter was with Jesus. Like He was like, yeah, I'm all for Jesus, kind of. And you know what changed everything for Peter? Wasn't the teachings of Jesus. Wasn't the miracles of Jesus. 
Wasn't Peter seeing Jesus' heart and compassion to serve people? That, that wasn't the game changer. The game changer for Peter is when Peter saw Jesus crucified and then Peter saw him alive. That was a game changer. That's when Peter went all in. Before, Peter had all of these doubts, all of these concerns, all of these unknowns, all of these questions. He was like, kind of, yay, Jesus, but not all in. But after Peter saw Jesus crucified and alive, it was game changer. And years after that moment, Peter, he writes these words. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Now, right before this section, Peter's actually giving some great instruction uh, to church leadership, leaders within the church. And so he's kind of addressing church leadership, and he goes, hey, for those of you who are younger, and he uses this word submit. It's a word that we looked at last week. The Apostle Paul used this word submit, which means hierarchy or order. Or like If you've served in the military, you understand the command structure. That's what submit means. And, and with Jesus, Jesus leveled the pay- playing field. Jew, Gentile, slave, free, man, woman. It didn't matter. All people were equal because Jesus. And so when Paul said submit, or Peter writes the word submit, he's like, this is a choice. It's not like a a dictator saying, you will submit to me. He's like, no, 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 choose to. And Peter's just saying, hey, if you're younger, submit to the elders of the church. And then Peter turns the corner. So he's coming out of church leadership talk to all of you. Now, all of you, well, that's, if you are a Jesus follower, if you're a Christ follower, you are part of Peter's all. Peter goes, hey, If Jesus is the subject of your life, you are all. He goes, all of you, clothe yourself. Now, this word clothe is such a cool, cool word. You see, in the ancient Greek, this this word clothe means to grab a, a towel, a scarf, and tie it around your waist, signifying, and this, this is so powerful, signifying that you're not free, you're a slave, you're a servant. So if you had a servant in your house, they would tie this scarf, this towel around their waist, and it would signify to everyone that this is the slave, this is a servant. And Peter sits there as he's writing these words out, and I think he comes to this, this one word, clothe, right, this ancient Greek word, and I think he pauses trying to find the perfect word, because here's, here's what's interesting about this one Greek word that we translate clothe. You know what? This is the only time in the entire New Testament that this one Greek word is used, the only time. Peter uses it. Now, I think for Peter, as he's searching for this one word, he has this crystal clear image that pops into his mind. Do you know those moments, all of you have these moments, do you know those moments that could be five years ago or 35 years ago that you can see right now in this moment with crystal clarity? You know those moments? A birth of a child, a, a wedding day, you know, that last moment with a loved one when you're saying goodbye, right? You... Right now, some of you, are, you're, you're thinking through those moments. I was at a soccer game watching my, my oldest daughter play soccer. There's a couple behind us, and they were sharing a story. She was sharing a story about uh, when she was in fifth grade, and her dad said something hilarious on the sidelines during the soccer game. And I turned around and looked at her. I said, you can hear your dad like he's here right now. You can picture that moment like it was today. And she goes, I can't. You know those moments? Sure you do. I think Peter had one of those moments. He's sitting there, he goes, all of you. And then he grabs this, this Greek word for clothe, and he goes, clothe yourself, this image of. And I think Peter goes back to this moment where they were sitting around a table. They had just finished dinner together. And all of a sudden, Jesus, their leader, gets up from the dinner table. He grabs a towel. And you know what Jesus does? He ties it around his waist and starts to scrub their feet. I think Peter goes, I witnessed this, saw this, couldn't believe that Jesus, our leader, signified by wrapping this towel around his waist that he's a slave, and he started to do what slaves do, scrub feet. I think Peter's mind just goes rushing back to that moment, and he could, he could see and smell the, the leftover food. He could see the people in their exact position around the table. He could see Jesus' face as Jesus got up from the table, and everyone's like, where, where, where's Jesus going? And he grabs a towel, and there, he's saying, so I remember when I felt the tension went inside when Jesus started wrapping that towel around his waist to signify that he's a slave, and then all of a sudden he bent down in front of me and started scrubbing my feet. I think Peter's like, like, all of you, clothe yourself in humility. Humble yourself to one another. 
see what Peter writes here. Different words. Same thing that the Apostle Paul wrote last week in part one of the series. When, when Paul wrote, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Peter, it's the same thing. He just writes different words. He goes, all of you, clothe yourself just like Jesus did with humility. You see, the pursuit, again, if you're a Christ follower, your pursuit is it's, it's all about the MSC, the mutual submission competition. Are you going to submit? Are you going to humble yourself to everyone? And then Peter, he gives us why. Why we should clothe ourselves in humility. He goes, because. And then Peter takes out this, this ancient Jewish proverb. He pulls this ancient Jewish proverb and goes, this is the why. This is why you should pursue the mutual submission competition. He goes, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Shows favor means to extend grace, to, extend grace, to cover with grace. And he's like, hey, hey, God, if you're humble, God's going to cover you with his grace. But God, Opposes the proud. No. Opposes the proud doesn't mean that God you know, just doesn't like prideful people or God doesn't like pride or God would recommend that, that we be humble instead of being proudful. Opposes the proud means this. That God attacks pride. That God wages war against pride. That God is not going to tolerate being proud because pride in all of us in all of us causes so much friction in our relationships and you know what you know what pride does pride powers us up and at the same time pushes someone down remember What's revealed on the outside is tethered to something on the inside. And I would just say, I would just say, if not for all of you, <laughs> most, what's tethered to wanting to win, what's tethered to conceding, what's tethered to avoiding, what's tethered to leaving is pride. It's powering up to push someone down. It looks different for every person, but I'm just telling you, it's tethered to pride to say, you know what? I'm gonna power up in this fight and I'm gonna shove you down. I know for me, and that's why I preface, I'm not bragging, I'm not saying, yay, look at me, I, I'm really good at winning fights. I'm serious, I was going through my slides, driving to a soccer game, flipping through these fights, engaging in a fight with my wife where I was winning. That's real and humbling. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I'm flipping through my slides to make sure I've memorized, and I'm now what? What is it tethered to? And Peter's like, hey, hey clothe yourself in humility because God opposes the prideful. And shows grace to the humble. And then he gives us the remedy. He goes, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. What a cool picture. He goes, humble yourself under God's mighty hand, under God's guidance, under God's direction, under God's discipline, under God's protection, under God's mighty hand. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand. And guess what? If you do that, he will lift you up. Something's going to lift you up. It's either going to be your pride that powers you up to push someone down, or you're going to humble yourself underneath God's mighty hand, and he will lift you up. The question is, who's doing the lifting, you or God? Who's doing the lifting? And then Peter goes, cast Toss, throw, lay all of your anxiety, all of your cares, all of your relationship frictions, all your loneliness, all your broken trust, all of your hurt, all of the unknown. Lay it all on God. Why? Because he cares for you. Now what's interesting is by the time Peter gets to write these words, 
Just like a few moments ago, he takes this ancient uh, Jewish proverb and pulls it in. These words here are found in the Jewish scripture as well. I mean, that was Peter's Bible. Peter didn't have the New Testament. He had the Bible he grew up with, the ancient Jewish scripture. We call it the Old Testament. And Peter then grabs this, the, this insight, the casual cares for this, was from the book we call Psalms. And Psalms is this collection of, of poetry, of songs, of heartfelt prayers, written by several different authors. But he actually grabs those words, cast your cares, cast your anxiety on God because he cares for you, from Psalm 55. Psalm 55 is written by King David, the famous King David. And David goes, listen to my prayer, oh God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. And here's the thing. I don't know what type of faith tradition you were raised in. But for some of you, you're raised in a faith tradition where prayer was just reciting what someone made you memorize. That was prayer. For some of you, you were raised in a faith, faith tradition that went something like this. Um, you would pray before every meal, rub-a-dub-dub, thanks to the grub, yay God. And you're hopeful that whoever's praying that prayer prayed it fast so you could eat fast, right? Like, for some of you, when you think about prayer, you're confused. You're like, I, Chris, I just don't know how to pray. Is that you? I don't know. I, what can I say? What can I say? If I say the wrong things, will God zap me, right? Like, when it comes to prayer, there's so much anxiety. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. I hope today, if just on the surface, you just see David's rawness with his prayer. Remember, this is King David, not just a king that sat on a, a pretty castle and never got his hands dirty. No, the, King David was warrior king, sword strapped to his side, fearless, would go to battle anyone. No matter how big the warrior is, King David wasn't scared of anyone. And I think when David sat down, and this was a song, by the way. This was a song with instruments that, that he would sing. And David sat down and said, God, listen to me. Come on, God, don't, don't ignore me. Hear me. And God, answer me. I mean, it was like the song you heard a few moments ago. What about us? What about love? What about trust? What about, what about? And I think this was David's heart plea. Hey, God, come on, I know you're busy and you're doing all these things around the world. I need you now. Forget everyone else. I need you. Listen to me. He goes, he goes my thoughts I'm so distraught. And he is as raw as you can imagine. Why? You're going to see. You can see why he's so distraught. He goes, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. Again, David's warrior king. He's like, if this was happening, okay, I'd go out on the battlefield. But then he says, he goes, he goes but as you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend. There was a relationship friction happening with someone who was inside David's inner, innermost circle. He goes, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. Let me translate that last thought. You know what David's saying? This close friend... We went to church together. This close friend, we worshiped together. This close friend, we would show up on Sunday church together. This close friend loved you, God. I thought I could trust him. I thought he was with me. I thought he loved you, God. This close friend. Have you ever been hurt by someone within the church? I've been in church leadership for 20 plus years. An amount of hurt, Christ followers, church people, has levied against me, my wife, my kids. Sickening. I do not say that for sympathy. Do not give me, don't go, oh man, I feel so sorry for you, Chris. Uh uh, I'm just telling you. If you've been hurt by church people, I, I want you here for me. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Because church people just don't come after me, they come after my family. That's, that's what happens. But here's the thing. Jesus experienced the same thing. From his closest friends. This is not a new storyline. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus, guess what David was dealing with? A church person. 
He goes, we went to church together. Well, then David goes on and he goes, let death take my enemies. Now he's focusing on these enemies on the outside because remember, David was warrior king. Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the realm of the dead. By the way, did, I, did you remember I said this was a song he was singing? Just imagine if we sang this song at church. <laughs> so uplifting, right? For evil finds lodging among them. He goes on, as for me, I call to God, and the Lord saves me evening, morning, and noon. And this isn't so much about three times a day. Think through it this way, that David was saying, God, throughout the course of my day, the beginning of my day, throughout my, my work day, throughout my school day, throughout my just life day, and, and until I go to bed, God, I, I'm coming to you. God, listen to me, hear me, don't ignore me, and answer me. He's like, evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. God who is enthroned from of old, who does not change, he, God, will hear them and humble them because they have no fear of God. And then David goes back to this close friend. He's like, hey, God, this close friend who I, who I see at church, my companion, attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. I mean, I thought we had a trusted friendship. I thought he would be there for me. I thought he had my best interests. I thought that no matter what would happen, it wouldn't separate. But God, there's so much friction within this, this relationship. He goes on, he goes, his talk is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His wor words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. Let me ask you this question. Do you have an ex-wife, ex-husband that... Their words are smooth as butter, but war is in their heart. Do you have an ex-husband, an ex-wife that now are dating someone, or now they're remarried, and their wife, their new husband, their words are soothing as oil, yet they are drawn swords? Do you have ex-in-laws that these would, words would ring true are you in a marriage right now and these words ring true and David's pouring his heart out to God all these chaotic thoughts he's just letting them go hey God God, do something. And after he gets all of this out, you know what David says? Cast your cares. Cast your anxieties on the Lord. Why? Because he's there for you. He will sustain you. Give it all to him. And God will never let the righteous be shaken. Now, David's going to end this prayer in a really cool place, but before he does, it's almost like as he's getting this all out and he lands on this really kind of like whew, peaceful moment to say, God, I'm just going to cast everything on you because I know you care for me. But it's almost like God, uh, David's like, hey, God, just want, uh, since I have your attention, God, since you're like, you're hearing me, God, since, since um, I've asked you to do something about this, God, and you're, you're connecting, like, God, like, I'm just going to, there's one more thing, and it's almost like, David's suggesting this to God. This is how I read it. It's almost like David's like, hey, God, um, while I have your attention, hey, um, um, I, I got to just say one more thing. And remember, again, remember, this is a song that he's singing. But God, and again, I, I just hear this as a question. But God, hey, will you bring down the wicked <laughs> into a pile of decay? Could you imagine if we sang this song on a Sunday or a Saturday night, right? Hey, God, will you... And God, you know, the bloodthirsty and the deceitful. <laughs> Can you cut their lives in half? And then he ends his prayer and says, but as for me, I trust.
trust in you. That's being underneath God's hand. So God will lift you up. I trust in you, you is humbling yourself underneath God's hand and say, God, there's a whole list of things that I'm not in control over. God, there's all of this friction around me and I can't make someone be who I want them to be. All I can do is become and becoming is all about humbling yourself under God's hand by saying, God, I will trust in you. I don't like it. I'm hurt. That person keeps hurting me. That person says they're there for me, but they're not there for me. I'm lonely. God, but I'm going to choose. This is becoming. I'm going to choose to be underneath your hand and God I trust trust that the rest of it is in your hand and when you humble yourself underneath God's hand he will lift you up and if you don't remember what is revealed on the outside is tethered to something on the inside and if it's not tethered to God to trusting him pride will power you up. Who or what are you going to be tethered to? A new round is going to start. And already you know the friction in your relationship. The question is this, when this round starts, it's going to be tethered to pride that powers you up to push people down. Or it's going to be tethered to trusting in God underneath his hand. And he will lift you up. The question is, are you going to become or are you going to find God's created us for relationship. I hope you know that. Even in all of the friction of our relationship, God has created us for relationship. And what's powerful when you think about the entire storyline in the Bible, God uses people like you and me, flawed, broken, doubting people, to impact other people's lives. And we say, God, I, I'm going to pursue you, pursue you with all of me, right? He gives grace to the humble, but opposes the proud. But when you allow God to take your story and inter, intersect it with someone else's story, I'm, just, I'm going to tell you, it's a game changer. Because God wants to take your story and engage with someone else. He goes, you know what? I, you went through something similar to what I went through. You're, you experienced something similar that I experienced. Can you help me? And vice versa happens. And that's why I can't encourage all of you enough to take a step into a life group. I can't. If you're married, you need to be in the life group. If you're dating, you need to be in the life group. If you, your spouse passed away, you need to be in the life group. If, you, if, you're not, if you're not sure if you ever want to date again, you need to be in the life group. Like if you have a relationship, you need to be in the life group. Because there's something about God taking your story and other people's story, intersecting those stories together. And when God intersects stories together, guess what? God does something amazing because God wants to use you to help people, and God wants to use other people to help you. And I get it that church people are church people. I get it. But I still choose to be in relationship. Why? Because Jesus modeled it. My hope is for all of you to take a step into a life group. Across all of our campuses, you'll see blue balloons. For those of you online, you'll get a link, and all of you can take out your phone and just text this number, 555888. Doesn't need an area code, six digits, and, and put in this one word, life path. One word, caps, doesn't matter. Life path. We'll send you a link. We'll help you get connected into a life group. I'm just telling you. Even in our friction feel, filled relationships, we need each other because God connects stories together to help us become who He desires for us to become. We're going to end with a song, and as you sing these words, I just want to share a few of these words that you're going to sing, you're going to hear in a moment. And I pray that as you sing these songs, as you listen to these songs, that you just picture God's mighty hand. And you just say, God, yeah, I, 
I'm just going to trust you. I'm not sure what that looks like. I'm not sure what all that means. But there's something about it saying, God, I'm just going to trust you. I'm just going to trust you. You see, in this song, these are some of the words. God, you tell broken things be healed and they're whole. God, you fear it has no place, it must go. God, tell death it has no chance, it won't win. And God, you are for me. And God, what can come against me? I believe it. I have seen it. That God is over all. I have seen it. I believe it. God, you're over all.